Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about creating a fair and just marketplace with Consumer Reports. James Dickerson, Chief Science Officer, Kristen Purcell, Chief Research Officer, and Leonora Wiener, um, Chief Operating Officer. So I've been really looking forward to this. I've been using Consumer Reports since, uh, I don't know, I maybe since I was in my mother's belly and I, I you know, she, she read Consumer Reports to me uh, during gestation. So let's talk about this organization founded in 1936, after the Great Depression, people were unemployed. Uh, there was uh, a, a real distress in this, in this country and you were founded to provide a product safety information to consumers. And now we're 85 years downstream so, uh, Leonora, could you just give us a sense of, of the evolution of the organization? Then we're going to bring it up to date. We're going to talk with, with James and, uh, and uh, Kristen and, and talk about the scientific research that you undertake. Well, thank you, Mark, and thank you for being a loyal CR fan for that long. Um, you're right. We're 85 years old. We're celebrating our 85th anniversary this year. We're a nonprofit, which many people do not know. They don't know we're 85 years old either. And what's unique about CR is just what you said, which is we have these amazing labs, this fantastic consumer survey research team, and those independent insights fuel everything we do from our product testing to our journalism, to our consumer advocacy. And that really is our special sauce. And we have been, we are a dynamic organization. You're right, we started out during the Great Depression, coming out of that, and here we are. And in some ways, the pandemic and the post-pandemic world that we're going to be living, living in it is very, very similar to that time. It's a hugely disruptive and transformative moment we're in. And what we are hoping for as an organization is that we can come out of this moment stronger, more stable, more secure. And that's what we're championing right now. And American industry has this great, great tradition of innovation, but there is also the issue of people making book, people making money out of creating shoddy product um, that consumers buy because they don't know any better. They're not necessarily informed and they have no way of knowing. In 1936, we have to remember that there was an explosion of new products uh, that were coming to market. And many of those products were, were dangerous. They contained chemicals that could harm people. They mechanically didn't work. They were breaking all the time. Uh, so James, uh, talk about that sort of aspect of, of, cause you take no commercial money, right? You None are whatsoever. And, and, and that's, that's, so you're, you're covering the product lines of all these companies, but zero commercial uh, money. So, so how do you get to the point where you can actually fund the investigations into products that companies with huge billions and billions of dollars of resource, of resource can shape and they have a real interest in seeing those sold but you have to basically start to evaluate in a neutral way whether these products are, are keeping the promises that are being made, right? Exactly right, Mark. So uh, you're right that uh, Consumer Reports uh, was founded on this idea of safety, making sure that the products that we buy, the products that we use every day, uh, not only perform properly, but are safe when they are performing what they're supposed to be doing. The way that we go about uh, being able to do all of the comparative uh, tests of products, goods, and services, as well as all of our investigations on the safe use uh, of these things is from our members. It's from people who uh, invest their ideas, their money, their time in supporting all of our endeavors to make sure that the consumer marketplace is fair, safe, and transparent. So our largest uh, uh, source of revenue of support comes directly from you, directly from people, regular people all around the country. You just got ten dollars from me, by the way, because I had to look up some products, and <laughs> you know I went to Consumer Reports, 
because it was the place I knew I was going to get, I was going to get clear information. Kristen, you're, you're a data scientist. Uh, could you talk a, a, about how data, you know, you have the, the basic research, which, which James undertakes and his team undertakes, but then you have to convert that into data that is accessible um, and, and that can be comparative and not, not all these products are necessarily immediately comparative. How does data um, transform into information? Thanks, Mark. Uh, and thanks again for having us. Uh, we're happy to have this opportunity. So, um, you know, James's side of the organization or his side of our, our data and science team is focused on the product testing. Um, my team is focused on making sure that the voice of the consumer becomes a part of everything that we do. And I think that combination um, is what makes us really unique. And it's, it's the value that we bring to the marketplace. Um, so we combine the lab testing uh, that our experts do in the labs with what my team does, which is a lot of survey research with um, our members. So a lot of people don't know that we have a very robust survey research team and that we actually survey our members on a regular basis about the products that they own. And we, we do that because we wanna know what happens when people bring these products home. And we wanna add that to our evaluation of the products. Are they reliable? Are people satisfied with the products that they purchased? And then we take that survey data and we combine it with our expert lab testing. And I, we think it gives us the perfect combination for people because it tells you how does this product perform in a lab? Does it do what it's supposed to do? And then it tells you what happens when you take it home? Does it, does it do what it's supposed to do over time? And will it continue to work for you or will you have problems with it? So in that way, we bring those two sources of data together and that's the scores that you see, the ratings that you see reflected on our And website. it's bi-directional, right? I mean, you are collecting data from your consumers, you're, you're moving data out into the field. And, and you're also, you know, consumers are not one thing. There are, there are men and women, there are people of all ages, there are people of all different um, uh, income levels, um, uh, races, ethnicities, needs, tastes, and so on. Uh, when, when you look at the evolution of, of this organization, and American society is not, thank God, what it was in 1936, how do you interact with your various constituents to ensure that you're meeting the needs of an inner city um, kid or an older person who is um, who is uh, living in, in in agricultural regions of the, of the country. How do you ensure that you are actually addressing all of America, not just a subset of, of those people who happen to have uh, internet access? Uh, even uh, Leonora, how how do you look at that problem set? Well, you you named it right on the the head. There, we we like to think of consumer reports as having a very big tent meaning that we do have to address the needs of all consumers. And we do that by making sure we understand what their needs are, what their challenges are. And so Kristen's team, for instance, really works very, very hard to make sure that we have a truly representative consumer panel and a truly representative um, set of consumers that we can engage with. And then of course, we are very fortunate that we have many channels for two-way conversation. Our social channels, for instance, is a great source of engagement and understanding. Is there uh, much of a community of, of these types of organizations uh, nationally and internationally? You know, if I look around the world, there are in Europe, there are, you know, in, in Germany and France and other places, there are um, a, a range of different organizations like yours. Do you interact with them, James? Yes, we have two organizations that we're very active with. One is Consumers International, which mm -hmm. is uh, the peer groups all around the world that are both consumer testing and consumer advocacy organizations like ours. Mm -hmm. And then we also belong to an international consortium of testing consumer organizations where we share test results and we do testing for each other. Oh, so you actually look at the techniques that, that James incorporates into, into your approaches. And I'd like to get into that, by the way. I'd like to talk a little bit about your labs and, and the, the competencies that you cultivate. But you're sharing this knowledge, right, James, in terms of how you actually appro approach problems? Exactly. So the idea is that 
we have our own protocols and procedures that we've developed based on very rigorous scientific methods, uh, very rigorous experience uh, about the products, about the manufacturer of the products, about the, the, the consumer food marketplace, the consumer product marketplace. And then we exchange ideas with our partners, our colleagues around the world, just so that we understand the different perspectives that come into the consumer marketplace. Now, more so than ever, the marketplace is a global marketplace. And so with that in mind, having different perspectives about a certain product that might be used in a certain way, let's say in Germany, but a slightly different way in Brazil, helps us understand even better the nature of the product in and of itself. And so that gives us a very keen advantage to understand how to develop said protocols and procedures, and then how to develop the types of surveys and investigations that Kristen's team does so that we have the most up-to-date, the most current, and the most insightful data that can lead to information that you possibly can about every aspect of the marketplace that I just mentioned. I'm going to stay with you for, for a moment, James. Um, we, we, we just completed a survey in which 84% of respondents have they use consumer reports to, like, like I do, to, to- Thank you for your support. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, James, uh, just sticking with you for a moment, one of the things that I find fascinating is the development of competency sets when you have so many different unlike competencies required in order to conduct these tests. You're talking about food chemists. You're talking about um, um, uh, non-organic uh, chemists you're, you know, for, for these safety protocols. You're talking about mechanical engineers, right? There are a lot of different competencies required to test these unlike products that are material sciences uh, uh, people. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how you hire and how you engage and whether you use subcontractors, how that actually uh, functions internally so that you can have the people there at your disposal uh, for, what, for the kind of testing you need to do? Certainly. That's actually a really good question. So uh, in our division of research testing and insights, the division that does the testing, that does the survey, we have approximately 140 to 150 staff ranging from uh, professional engineers, you know, uh, fully accredited uh, professional engineers to PhDs in a variety of physical, uh, biological and social sciences. We have those experts because we wanna make sure that we develop tests, be it as simple as turning on and off a switch to making sure you understand the, the fundamental chemistry of baby food. All of that is required to ensure that we know what is going on with each and every product. And so we split up those different teams into groups of expertise. Those groups of expertise range in, for example, electronics. So we have people that are very well versed in not only how electronic devices like televisions perform, but how they're built. And so if you understand how they're built as well as how they perform, you have the best perspective and the best opportunity, not only to understand, okay, this is a well-performing uh, device, but you have insight into this is where there might be a point of failure or a point of disconnect in how they operate for a consumer at home. Or that one product might cause pollution uh, downstream, and another product less less so. So when when you're taking this information, which you get from uh, Kristen in terms of what people are worried about, yes, what, what, what's going to motivate them, you're actually converting the data coming in from Kristen into um, into uh, research targets, and then into competency sets. And then you hire people so that you have the competency sets at the time when you do the testing, right? Exactly right. So it's more than a two-way street, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, yes, information comes from the testing laboratories into Kristen's teams. And information from Kristen's teams comes into us. But it's not just these two-way streets. It's sort of like a two-way street combined with a roundabout. 
because it gives us the ability to distribute information directly to consumers. It gives us an ability to use it as a feedback loop back into the development of the most contemporary protocols and procedures. It also gives us an opportunity to survey the, the US public and then say, hey, maybe we should ask other questions or maybe we should develop a, a, a line of inquiry in this trajectory. And that is the feedback loop that then informs more uh, data and hence more information about not just the marketplace in of itself, but our lives. That, I mean, CR is, is not just a marketplace focused organization. It, it's an organization that is trying to improve the lives of everyone in society. And, and Kristen, we just got we just got some information coming in, which which you can send right to James. Um, one of our attendees needs a new tall stainless steel dishwasher, <laughs> and uh, also would like to have a recommendation on a printer. So we're collecting this information all the time, right? But you're doing it in, in, in a very organized way. So uh, could you talk a little bit about um, how you go out and find out uh, what people are interested in? and ensure mm -hmm. that you're not just um, addressing the interests of people of a certain income level or a, or a region, because that's a very, very tricky thing. It's not just the information that cascades into you because that's self-selected. You actually have to shape how you reach out so that you are, you are connecting with all Americans. How do you do that? Yeah, it's critically important today, especially. So we do, we're very committed to making sure that we understand the full range of consumer experiences. We understand disparities in consumer experiences. We understand where there's diversity across consumer experiences. So the way we do that, we have a very robust um, nationally representative survey research program. We're out in the field monthly, at least, and sometimes more often than that. Um, and we use gold standard survey methodologies. So we make sure that we have representation from all the key demographic subgroups across the country. And that allows us to A, keep track of what are the key, what are the key issues at the moment for consumers, right? We always want to have our finger on the pulse of what consumers are worried about, what do they care about, what are the pain points they're experiencing as a consumer. And again, looking for disparities where there are any. And then we also um, sometimes we'll take things that maybe we're seeing in the lab, right? Like, like we're seeing privacy issues or we're seeing other concerns in products, we're seeing trends. And we'll go out to consumers and try to try to learn how much do they know about this? What is their sense of, of how this works? What is their sense of what digital privacy means? Um, how do they try to control access to their data when they're using different products? So as James said, it's very much a two-way street, um, but we are, we are always tracking the consumer experience across the US and we are always looking at the diversity of those experiences. And inclusion is such an important issue. If you're going to end systemic disparities in this country, you really do have to think, uh, think differently. Have you changed your methodologies as we all have become more uh, sensitive in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and, and Breonna Taylor and all these different uh, issues that have exploded a, a, um, a, you know, there's been an uneven consciousness of disparities in the United States, right? Those people who suffer those disparities are more conscious than those who perpetrate them. I think now what's, what's happened is that everybody has, it, it's really been, been one of those crystallizing moments where we can actually see across divisions of race, income, uh, individual circumstance, how are you adjusting internally so that you're thinking in, in the sense of inclusion, are you hiring different people? Are you using different methodologies? Is gold standard, for example, is that changing to incorporate those elements as well? Yeah, I can speak to the methodology and then I think Leonora can speak to sort of our internal practices as an organization. But yes, we have changed our methodology over the last several years and it's involved a commitment and an investment um, to make sure that we have large enough samples that those samples include, for instance, a large enough Spanish speaking population. And we make sure that our surveys are always translated into Spanish so that people can take the survey in their language of preference. We've recently added Asian American oversample to our national 
national surveys as that's become a, um, a bigger part of the US population. It's the fastest growing part of the US population. And there's interest in understanding how the experiences of that group might be similar to or different from others. And, and we do now always do our research with an eye toward, you know, what are the distinct experiences people are having? We saw in our COVID research, for example, as many other organizations did, that COVID was having tremendously disparate impacts on different parts of the population. Uh, young adults, women, uh, Latinx adults were experiencing much greater income and job loss, higher rates of depression. So we are we are always looking at that and we are always evolving our methodology to make sure we're doing it the best way possible. Leonora, do you, would you care to comment? We just did, uh, incidentally, a, a poll that just finished and we asked, who do you trust most for evidence-based product research, testing and information? And what is so interesting is that in this day where we are inundated with top 10 reviews and, and all these different uh, uh, journalistic type organizations that are, that are promoting products. Consumer Reports still scores 73% uh, in terms of trust. Uh, and then the next is, is uh, word of mouth and, and personal interactions at, at, at retailers. So uh, you're, you're still right up there. But Leonora, could you, could you describe how you function uh, both in terms of evolving the organization for this modern age, and in particular, the whole issue of how do you operate in COVID, where people can't necessarily gather together in the same room and do the things that they're accustomed to doing. Yeah, I would love to, to add to this. One of the things that we piloted this year, for all the reasons you just outlined, is what we call CR Recommended. We know there is so much misinformation out there. We also know that not every consumer knows about CR or can afford a membership. So CR recommended is where our recommended logo is on particular items, particular products out in the marketplace, both on digital channels and also in store. And this is going to bring CR's independently created recommendations to a much wider swath of Americans. And we're very excited about that. We've seen great engagement on it so far. And it really does what I just said. It puts CR where and when people are shopping, both digitally and for the limited in-store that is happening now. But it also makes sure that we are standing up for truth in the marketplace wherever we can. So that's one example of how we've been piloting reaching new consumers in new ways. So I have a question uh, about that. Um, and you know you know what's coming, right? Who pays for CR recommended? <laughs> if yes. I make a product, do I, do I just pay you? And, so, and you know, you get money from me to so that you so that I get to use your logo? Yes, after we issue our recommendations, we have a third party organization that licenses this mark to manufacturers. And it pays for the administration and the monitoring of this. It's a minimal license fee that allows us to run the program. And this way we have all the important firewalls that we need to have. Our independence is not at question because as I said, we, we follow the exact same protocols People can only see this once we've issued our recommendations online and in the magazine. So that's really interesting. I, I, I love the, the, this element because it's very important, right? The idea of a third party. Yes. Right? So that they are going out um, and after you have done your recommendations, they're going out and they are um, they're placing this as also a public awareness campaign. It gets you out into the market. So when, when somebody is looking at a product, somebody is in a shop, somebody is online, you're increasing uh, consumer sensitivity to your mark, but the credibility of that is untouched because it's not a pay for play situation. Exactly. And you said it when we started out, Mark, the scale of CR against the scale of advertising budgets and the, you know, just the deluge of misinformation, we have to be in there. We have to say what is truthful, what is scientific. So um, as, as we're looking at the, at the evolution of, of this sector, of the sector of, of consumer and consumer empowerment, how do you see um, the future as, as developing. We are seeing products 
going more global and sourcing for those products going more global. And it becomes much more complicated, James, when you look at products that are assembled in all these different places, that are sourced in all these different places from, from materials that are just difficult to analyze, right? I mean, it's, it's not like a integrated supply chain in one country. You know, as, as soon as you test a product, you've got components coming from all these different places. They come together, they work together, they don't work together. Um, you, it, it's a much more complicated uh, chain. How do you evolve the organization to deal with that complexity so that consumers are not disempowered by globalization? So one of the things that we do is that we have staff that focus just on what is the state of the marketplace today. We have market analysts that give us uh, a tremendous wealth of information, not just about the features on a particular gadget, but information about the uh, country of origin uh, of the gadget, uh, how it was constructed and how this particular gadget with this number and this particular gadget with what appears to be identical number, you know, model number, in fact, are two different objects that are being sold by uh, a certain manufacturer. And so that provides a tremendous amount of information for our testing staff to say, okay, this is how we're going to approach testing this and juxtapose that information with this. So you have a product that it's called the same thing, but it's not the same thing not the same thing. And we're able to, because we, because we are very fortunate to have deeply knowledgeable experts in these different product categories. It could be automobiles, it could be toasters, uh, it could be vacuum cleaners that know the products, that are aware of the products and are aware of market trends, uh, you know, new features that are coming on. That gives us, again, that, that that special insight to be able to make those types of uh, changes in the procedures so that we can see very clearly, okay, this is how this is performing and this is how this is performing. You would assume because they look identical to each other that they should be behave the same way. But in fact, they have very divergent behaviors. That expertise gives us the ability to uh, discern those minute sometimes minute differences so that's a great point you have to track things like least cost manufacturing trends right and and where things are being uh produced and 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 those uh that divergence you know we just completed another uh survey Kristen. here's here's a, a data point for you we had a 73 percent trust level in consumer reports on our previous survey and we we asked a different question who do you trust the most with 73% consumer reports? Who do you use the most? 43%. <laughs> you have a 30% opportunity here because if you trust the most 73% and use the most 43%, you've got a 30% uh, margin to make up. How do you, how do you shift awareness um, of consumer reports um, and then let's let's also uh, move that over to uh, to Leonora because I know this is this is your area. But how do you shift awareness? How do you make up for that gap in how you interact with the marketplace and how you engage people in giving you feedback to make to make this information more accessible? Well, I think again, part of part of the key is is our messaging to consumers, to our members, that they drive a lot of the work we do. They are they are our partners in a lot of the work we do. So we need them to help us in our endeavors. We need the data we collect from them. We need their engagement. We need their involvement. And so I think it's important to get that get that message out to today's consumers that we're not just here as experts to just share information with you. We want to engage engage with you and we want you to be our partners in this process because your experiences, your pain points, the issues you care about is what is going to drive a lot of what we focus on. And even to the extent of driving our testing protocols, as we mentioned, we will do user research to find out if people are using products in their homes the way we think they are. And we will pass that information along to the testing team and they will adjust their protocols. So I think, I think that is key. My guess would be that the 
most used in the in the poll you did is probably online reviews, maybe from. That's from, right. Well, yes. It's not, not the, most, <laughs> the most used, most used is still Consumer Reports, but this is a a um, gotcha. select audience. But yeah. we do have a 26% uh, response on social media reviews. How do we make consumer reports more user-friendly? Lenora, we're gonna give you the last word since we're coming to the end of our time. How do we make this renowned uh, organization that has been around for 85 years, faithfully serving the American public, so easy to use that we use you before we use YouTube, we use you before we use top 10 reviews or before we use Yelp. How do we do that? We have to do two things. We have to be where consumers are in all the channels that they are in. And we have to communicate that we are a purpose-driven organization. We're not here just to help you pick the, you know, the best phone. We are here because we collectively our consumer voice is strong when we are together. And so creating that affinity with the organization around our purpose and not just our purchases, that's what we have to do. And so we're, we're working on both fronts. This is just a wonderful message, right? A, a message of unity, involvement, right? Civil society engagement. Thank you all. Thank, thanks to you at the uh, Consumer Reports team. Thank you so much for sharing the wisdom of Consumer Reports with us. Thank you, participants, for your questions, for your attendance, and we'll see you on Thursday when we'll be talking about child advocacy. Have a great day. That's the Nonprofit Report. Stay safe, everyone. <music>